morning I was actually thinking about it too. I thought I might, uh, might actually preach from the Bible today too. Yeah. Um, well, good evening. I'm Pastor Brandon. I'm filling in for Pastor Derek tonight. And um, Pastor Derek asked me to minister from uh, John chapter 13. So if you would, if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. We'd love to put one in your hand so you can follow along with us. This is a very well-known story in the scriptures about the washing of the disciples' feet. And so we're just going to go by this, uh, through this verse by verse and kind of uh, explore this story and see what God is speaking to our hearts tonight. And so as you open up to John 13, uh, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we believe that in your word, God, is, is, it's infallible. Uh, God, that what you've wanted to say, what you want to say, uh, God, what you're saying today to all of mankind is, is written within these pages. God, all that we need for a life of godliness. God, all that we need to behold your glory. Father, all that we need to, to live a daily life in hope and in strength, God, is provided in your word. So, Father, we ask tonight that you would uh, speak to us, God, that you would open up our eyes to see what it is exactly that you would say to us tonight. So, Father, minister through me and help me not to be a hindrance or get in the way, God. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we have uh, some, some dear family here. I, um, they had mentioned to me that they're uh, just believing in faith for their daughter to come to the Lord. So I just thought we would, we would pray. Um, and her name is Kimberly. Am I saying that right? Okay. Uh, so if you would pray with me for, for Kimberly as well. And uh, if you have a family member who is in need of, of salvation, then uh, plead for somebody else's family member as you would plead for your own. And, and uh, we believe that, that as you're about the Lord's business, he'll be about yours, right? So, Father, we lift up Kimberly to you, God. We ask that, uh, Father, that you would send somebody, Lord, to minister the word to her, to remind her of the seed of faith that's been planted in her heart. God, that you'd bring it to remembrance by your Holy Spirit. God, that you would cause that seed to grow into living faith. And, God, that she would come to you. God, we pray that you would uh, break her heart or fill her with joy, whatever it takes to draw her to the cross. God, we ask that you would save her soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through this, this story. It's a short story, so I'm just going to read through it one time, and then we'll kind of come back and uh, visit it verse by verse. So if you would, uh, just read with me John 13. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured out water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, he sat down again and he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, be blessed. Uh, blessed are you if you do them. I just kind of uh, ran across a, a story tonight of uh, a gentleman who had gone to a, another part of the country, and as was their custom, if anybody had uh, a need of a place to stay, it was customary to allow strangers uh, to stay with you, to, uh, to be of service to them. And so uh, this gentleman knocks on the door, knowing that that was the custom, and just said, hey, I, I, I really have no place to stay. And uh, there was a woman there, and her eyes were bloodshot red. She looked like she had been crying, but she didn't say anything. She just uh, gave him a smile, uh, happily took him in, uh, began to feed him and take care of his needs. And um, at one point, it looked like she was going to turn to him and, and say something. Uh, but just as she was getting ready to open her mouth, she, she stopped herself, held her tongue, and walked away. Uh, shortly after that, the, the husband of the household had, had come out and uh, greeted him and blessed him in the name of the Lord, said, God bless you, and, um, and just made sure that he had all that he needed for his night's nice stay. Um, but he also had looked like his, his, his tears, his eyes were kind of puffy, looked like he had just got done crying, uh, but made no mention of anything and, and went in and, and shut the door and the man had the night stay there. Uh, the following day he left and as he was headed through the town, he kind of ran into the town priest and, uh, the gentleman asked him, said, where, where did you stay last night? And he told him the house that he had stayed and he said, oh, did did you get wind of, of what had happened? He said, well, get wind of what? I didn't hear of anything. He said, oh, that, that couple that you stayed with, uh, they had just lost their one and only son uh, the night before. And he said, oh, wow, I, I, I had no idea. And um, it dawned on him that they had comforted him and while they were in distress. And he thought about it even more and thought, you know, I never even heard them weeping. I never heard them cry. And then he realized that they had, uh, they had shut the door and they had wept quietly so that they could uh, allow him to enjoy his night's stay. And the more he thought about it, a tear began to well up in his eye. And the priest looks at him and says, uh, why are you crying? And then he says, oh, I, uh, never mind, I, I understand. You're a young man, you're not used to dying yet. He wasn't referring to the death of the son he was referring to the death of the couple that they laid aside their wants and their desires and they died to themselves to take care of their neighbor. As we read John 13, we're, we're reading exactly this where Jesus is commanding us to, to die to ourselves and to love our neighbor as Christ loved us. I'm going to go back and we're just kind of going to look at the story in deeper context. Now before the feast of Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So as John is narrating his experience and kind of retelling it for us, I think it's very important uh, that he kind of gives this intro because he knows what Jesus is about to do, but we don't know it yet. We, we have to read through. And so he's kind of giving us an intro as to what Jesus was about to do, but the pretense of why Jesus was about to do it. And he says, Jesus knew his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father. So it's on that basis. And, and he actually, if you skip down, he says it again in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. And it was on that basis that he rose from supper and laid aside his garments. But going back up to, to verse 2, it says, And supper being ended, the devil having already... put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, And if you really think about the story, just kind of, you know, put yourself there that in that moment, uh, the devil had put into the heart of, of Judas Iscariot. And I just want to throw in there that God is absolutely sovereign over all the affairs of the world, and yet God himself does not do evil. 
The Bible says that Christ was slain from the foundations of the world, that before the world even existed, before you and I were ever even created, before Adam and Eve ever came into existence, God had already ordained the crucifixion of his son, and yet God never put it in Judas's heart to crucify his son. Now, if that, if that confuses you, that's because you and I are not God. Simple enough, right? That God is absolutely sovereign over all the wickedness that happens on, in the earth, but yet God never does wickedness. It was Judas's desire to kill Jesus, and Satan had put it into his heart. And yet, over all the wickedness that happens in the world, God orchestrates it in such a way as to use it for his glory and for your good. Can I just say right there that whatever wicked you have done or whatever wicked has been done to you, God has ordained it and orchestrated it in such a way that it would work out for your good, that you would draw closer to him, that you would know him. And we know that because the central event of the universe was the worst wickedness that have ever been done on the face of the planet earth and that was the crucifying the killing of God's own son and yet we see that through the worst tragedy that had ever happened on planet earth that all uh, mankind now has the ability to become saved through the death of Jesus Christ I, I just think it's important to view to view all the world through that lens as we think about the tragedy that has just happened in Florida and we say, where is God? And yet the reality is, is God is in the midst. God was on the cross and he's not, he, he, he wasn't just on the cross. He rose and that his Holy Spirit is in the world, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I have a, a friend who's part of this church and he's part of this church because of, uh, because of the, the Route 91 concert. He had a friend that had passed away and he was sh shaken up. And, and the first time I saw him, and, and, and we've talked about it since, I said, the first time I saw you, you looked so lost. I mean, almost to the extent that, that it looked like an, another spirit had, had taken over you, just this sense of hopelessness. And now you look at him, and there's life in his eyes. It, it's not that everything is all good now. He's still walking through some things, but there's, there's evidence that a change has taken place in his heart. And that in the midst of tragedy, God used that for this young man to draw him to church, to hear the gospel. And now he has a hope he never had before, that out of death sprang life. God is good. It's not enough to say that God is sovereign. But we got to know that in God's sovereignty, he's good. It's not enough to just know that God is in control of all things, but that in the midst of all things, he's controlling things in such a way that he's working it out for your good. For all things work out for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. You know, if you go back up to verse 1, it says... Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the, what? To the end. He loved them to the end. Meaning that up until uh, the moment that he had called them, and, and, and really, if you, if you know your Bible, uh, it wasn't really that he loved them from the moment that he had called them. Because Ephesians 1 tells us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Having loved them, he calls them to himself, and then he loves them to the end. And I believe this is a, a reference to his getting ready to die. He loved them to the moment of his crucifixion. He walked with them. They, they doubted, right? They, they complained. They, uh, they asked for things they shouldn't have asked for. They were prideful and boastful. They were doubtful. And in the midst of all of that, he loved them and he carried them. And I would just ask the question, how was it that he loved them 
to the end. And I think this is an important question because Jesus is getting ready to say, as we just read, that as I have loved you, you also go and love others. So I just kind of want to pause there for a moment and ask the question, how did he love them to the end? Because if that's the command he's given to me, is to love as he loved me, then, then let's explore that. I would say, number one, he prayed for them. He prayed for them often. Luke 22, 31, we see that um, Jesus had insight into Peter's heart. And not only did he have insight into Peter's heart, but he had insight into the devil's plans. And he knew that Satan wanted to get a hold of Peter. And if you look at Peter's life, I mean, you can kind of see why, right? I mean, Peter always kind of liked to stay three steps ahead, say things he shouldn't have said, do things he shouldn't have done. And, and you can just kind of see that because I think all of us could see a little bit of Peter in us or a little bit of us in Peter. And you can just see how the devil likes to get in there. You know what I'm saying? So Jesus, knowing this, says to Peter, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, his name was Simon Peter. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Can you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, telling you that he, he prayed for you? I mean, I just wonder, is that, is that a prayer that, that, uh, you know, that God thinks about, right? I mean, when Jesus prays, uh, is, there, is there any doubt that that prayer will come to pass? Remember when Jesus prayed out loud and he said, Father, I know that you hear me, you always do. But the reason that I say this is not for my sake, but for those around. I want them to know that I know that you hear me. And you always hear me. In fact, we know that Jesus' prayers always get answered. Well, except for in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he said, if there be any other way, take this cup from me. And in a way you can say heaven was silent. But then he said, not my will, but your will be done. But here we see in verse 32 that Jesus was very confident that his prayer for Peter was going to get answered because he said, I prayed for you. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then listen to what he says. And when you have returned, right, Peter, you're going to fall. Satan, Satan is going to get a hold of you. But I've prayed that he doesn't get a hold of you in such a way as to make you stumble unto death. And I'm so confident that my prayer is going to be answered that I'm not saying when you return or, or rather if you return, but rather when you return. Oh, Peter, you will return because God answers my prayers. Now, you might think, well, that's good for Peter. Can I just remind you that Romans 8 tells us that not only did God give his son to die for you, but it says, furthermore, he is risen at the right hand of God, interceding for you. I mean, do you, do you think about that? How did, you, how did you come to faith? I believe you came to faith because Jesus was praying for you. How are you going to remain in faith? I believe you're going to remain in faith because Jesus is praying for you. Oh, and by the way, Jesus' prayers do get answered. Can I get an amen right there? You might feel like your prayers are weak, but there's one who prays for you. That's not an excuse not to pray. In fact, that's the reason to pray all the more, because your prayers are being intermingled with the prayers of Christ. In fact, he prays through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he prays for him that his faith may not fail. By the way, how does faith not fail? I mean, how do you have sustaining faith? 
I mean, how does God answer that kind of prayer? Does he wave a wand and just ensure that faith doesn't fail? Is there a strategic way that faith is strengthened? Is there a way that faith is sustained? And the answer is, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you recall my prayer as I uh, prayed for Kimberly, my prayer was specifically, God, send somebody into her life to preach her the gospel. Reminder of the word that's already been placed in her heart. When you pray for somebody to come to Christ, when you pray for somebody's faith to be strengthened, uh, just know that there's a way that that happens. It doesn't just happen by the, the flicking of, of glitter, gold dust over their heads, right? The way that God does it is he, he sends a minister of the gospel. And when I say a minister of the gospel, I mean, I mean anybody who's willing to declare the truth, right? It might be a, a friend, a co-worker uh, at, at work. It might be somebody on the bus, and because of your prayer, somebody sitting next to them just feels stirred up. In fact, you know what I'm saying is not crazy because that's you, right? You ever, you ever think about this, that uh, when you have a desire in your heart to minister the gospel, it's because somebody is praying to the Father that you would preach to their loved ones? Did you ever think about that, that that stirring is actually the answer to a mother's prayer? One more reason not to shut our mouth, right? Come on. She's praying. He's praying. And you're the answer to their prayer, that they might have faith. And that faith come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So he prays for them. How else did he keep them? Well, he, he keeps them in the same manner. He, sanct he sanctifies them by the truth. Turn with me just a couple pages over to John chapter 17. And if we're going to read just this portion of scripture. I could just pull out a snippet, but it's too good to skip by. So remember, he says, uh, those that were in the world, I have kept them. And this is a good scripture reference because it's almost the same wordage. In verse 6 of chapter 17, he says, I've manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You, you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. By the way, I, I love that. I don't want to get sidetracked, but it's just too, it's, you know, it's just too good, right? Um, he says, as he's praying for the disciples, he, he comes to God and says that they have kept your word. He, he doesn't say, oh, man, they, they stumbled. Uh, Peter turned his back on me, right? When Jesus presents you before the Father, he presents you as spotless and blameless. You can, you can think on that. I, I just love that. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all the things which you have given me are from you. They have known, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but pray for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all are mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them now I am no longer in the world but these are in the world and I come to you Holy Father keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are so he's asking God to keep them while I was with them in the world I kept them in your name those whom you gave me I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. That's a reference to Judas. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. How many, how, how many of you find yourself praying, God, take me, just take me out of the world? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I've prayed that prayer a few times. 
I just want to remind you, your prayer doesn't line up with Jesus' prayer. He says, God, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world. I'm just praying that you would keep them from the evil one. So should our prayers be. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And if you would with me, just focus here on verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they should also, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Christ sanctified them. He sanctified them by the word. Well, what does that mean? That means that, that he set them apart, right? If you're saved, the evidence that you're saved, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if your name is written in the book of life in heaven, the evidence that your name is written in the book of life in heaven is that you are being sanctified by God. You're being set apart. God is, is washing you with the water of his word, right? There's no such thing as being, as being um, saved and living unrighteously and being confident of salvation. You cannot be confident of salvation if you're living unrighteously because the evidence of your salvation is that you're being sanctified for this is the very purpose for which you were saved. That you would be set apart by the washing of God's word your faith for obedience. Now, you are not sanctified so that you can be saved. You're saved so that you can be sanctified. There's a big difference there. God is conforming you and I to the image of his son. That's the purpose of our salvation. Unless we're being conformed, there's no evidence we're saved. Unless the purpose is being fulfilled, there's no evidence that the purpose was ever accomplished. Are you with me? And let, let, us, let me just remind us that sanctification is a process, right? I'm not saying you're made into the image of his son. Although that would be true. The Bible says he who is in Christ is a new creature instantly, right? Old things have passed away. All things become new. What God has done in the heart is done once and for all. You're changed, but it takes a while for your mind to catch up to your heart, right? Your mind has to be renewed. You got to remember, right? You got to get into God's word and remember, oh yeah, oh yeah, th this is who I am. Because I forgot. Anybody have a forgetful moment? Come on, Jesus. Thank God for grace, right? If any one of us sins, you have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if you'll, be, uh, if you'll confess your sins, uh, he'll be faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We all need cleansing, right? And in fact, this is what Jesus is about to tell us, that uh, although you are cleansed once and for all, you still need a daily washing. He sanctified them by the truth. Number three, he gave them the Holy Spirit. John 16, 5, turn with me there, go back. Uh, one page possibly in your Bible. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. By the way, it, it is sin not to believe in Jesus. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me. 
for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. The means in which God sanctifies us is by filling us with the Holy Spirit. And so you might ask the question, well, how does the Holy Spirit set us apart? I thought you said the Word of God sanctifies you. The Word of God sets you apart. And I would say they go together. Because the scriptures say that they go together. This is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enters into a man, a woman, and what happens is the Holy Spirit begins to declare to you the truth of God. So that outside of the Holy Spirit, when you and I did not have the Holy Spirit, there was a time, some of, some of you guys can remember this in a very real way, there was a time you opened up your Bible, you had no idea what it meant, right? The worst of us, and I say the worst of us, we were all, we were all sinners, right? Uh, actually acted like we knew what it was saying. But the evidence that we didn't really comprehend what it was saying is that it really had no effect on our lives. Because if we really would have seen it for what it was, it would have struck our heart like, 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 like a man strikes a rock when he's digging for gold. But it had no effect. It had no change. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2.13 says this, The things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Did you know the Holy Spirit teaches you? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man, the natural man, that's, that's the man that is naturally born. All of us were naturally born, right? Nobody in this room was born filled with the Holy Spirit. I talk to people all the time who tell me that they were, they were a Christian since they were born. It's not in your Bible. You may have got saved earlier than you can remember. But there was a moment when you did not have the Holy Spirit. And that moment was the day of conception. It was the day that you were born. David said it like this. I was born in sin in my mother's womb. I was shaped in iniquity. I was a rebel. But there was a day that I heard the gospel. I believed and I was filled with the Holy Spirit. For, for some of you in this room that may have been at the age of two or three years old. And I believe God is merciful enough to accept your, your little seed of faith as a two or three year old and, and fill you with the Holy Spirit. And so you grew up your whole life thinking, well, I've always known Jesus. No, you didn't. All right, when you were two years old, you didn't know him, right? Now, I'm not saying that a, a, a two-year-old, if they were to die without the Holy Spirit, would, would go to hell. That's a question I can't answer. Uh, what we see in Scripture is that men are accountable for what they know. They'll be judged according to what they know. A two-year-old can only know so much and respond to that and the revelation of God. And, and um, so we would lean towards uh, grace, absolutely. But bottom line is, uh, when you come to a place where you're able to decipher truth, when you're able to know what's wrong and rebel against it, you're accountable for that. Some people would call it the age of accountability. You can't necessarily find that in the Bible. You can find the principle of it in Romans 1, 2, and 3. It's definitely there in principle. But that term age of accountability does not exist in the scriptures. So what am I saying? If you, if you got lost, here's what I'm saying. Um, the Bible makes it clear that without the Holy Spirit, Jesus said it like this. Uh, instead of putting it in my own words, I'll just put it in the words of Christ. Unless you be born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. The Spirit teaches the natural man, the man who's born without the Spirit, reads the Bible, hears the gospel, and cannot perceive it. Verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So right now in this room, I'm, I'm just going to be as blunt as I possibly can. Right now in this room, there are possibly a few people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, uh, I meant to say the opposite. There are possibly, there's like only a few of us, right? I hope not. Uh, but right now in this room, there are a few of us in this room uh, who, who are, are maybe come to church often, but have never been filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And the evidence is there's no change of heart. You, you are as you've always been. Yeah, you have a respect for God, but even that condemns you. Because if you really had a respect for God, then you would do His will. But instead, you sin willfully. And the fact that you say God is worthy of respect makes you worthy of judgment on the day of judgment. Because what will you say when you stand before Him? You cannot say you didn't know. You cannot say you didn't think that He was worthy. Otherwise, you would have lived up to His expectation. Because out of your own mouth, you have confessed that there is a God, that He sent His Son to die on the cross, and that He's worthy of all honor. And yet in saying that, you turn and you live a life in complete rebellion against Him what will you say on the day of judgment? You will be without excuse. And the scripture says that there are those who hear the gospel and it has no effect on their heart because their hearts are wicked. They hear the gospel and they cannot perceive it because it's foolishness to them. There are those right here, right now, who the gospel has no effect. And of course, I'm hoping and praying that even as the word is going forth that God will change that because I believe the power of the gospel for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for those that believe I believe the, God, the gospel is able to impart faith to the unbeliever that the hearing of the gospel is able to make a non-seeker a seeker and those who would not seek desire to seek so God fills us with the Holy Spirit Christ fills us with us with the Holy Spirit so that we would have a desire to seek God and that we would be able to understand the knowledge of God so going back to the experience there are those who read their Bible as, as was me I remember somebody gave me a, a Bible in, in high school uh, it was a small orange Gideon Bible uh, I took it home I remember sitting in my chair to this day. I was probably, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I went to the book of Proverbs and I read it and I was like, oh, this is really good. That's really wise. Right. And there was other stuff I read. I was like, I have no idea what that means. But even the stuff that I said was really good. I still had no idea what it meant. Because if I if I really thought it was good, I would have tried to apply it. But did I? No, not at all. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, then I began to open up God's word and I go, oh, oh. You know, there were common phrases and, and you know, I'm speaking to Holy Spirit filled people in here. So I'm, you know, I know you can relate to what I'm saying. There were phrases that came to life to me, like the phrase, oh my God, right? Just a common phrase. Well, that, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, that, that phrase took on a whole new meaning. And then, in fact, I used to, then I would begin to see it in the Bible. David would pray and he'd start off his prayer. Oh, my God. Bless the, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then I hear somebody uh, see a car accident and they cry out, oh, my God. And I think, oh, man, that... That's a precious prayer right there. David, you know, when David said that, he really meant that. Like, he was really praying to God. Like, you just said it because you saw a car accident. I mean, if you saw the car accident and you actually thought about God, and you were like, oh, my God, you know, help them. But that's not what you were saying. You were just like, oh. And you, you, and you used the, uh, his precious name for no reason. You used his name in vain. There were things that came to life to me. You know, the rainbow came to life to me, right? You know what I'm talking about. The rainbow used to just be this thing in the sky, right? It's like, oh, cool, and there's a rainbow. Now it's like there's a rainbow, and it's like, oh, God, that's your covenant. That's your promise. I remember the day we moved in our house two years ago, and, and, and on our moving date, there was a rainbow in the sky. And I remember uh, I, had a, I had a friend that was helping me move, and and we went in, uh, I, I ran up the second, you know, story in, in my son's room now, it is, and I looked out the window, and uh, from, our, from his room, you could, the next 
uh, over the fence is, is the, what do you call it, the post office, right? Not the greatest view, but you can see the, the rainbow from over there. So I'm looking at it. I got a high school student with me. He helped me move that day, and I'm looking at the rainbow, and I'm, I'm just like ready to cry. I'm like, There's, look at the rainbow. <laughs> Out of all days, you know, God reminds me of his covenant in Genesis. He's just reminding me of his grace. And, 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 you know, I didn't say all that. I'm just looking at it. And my friend is, is a high school student, and he's like, what, so help me out here. Like, what, what are you seeing? Like, I see the rainbow. It's cool and all, but what, what's, what's up? And, and I just told him very briefly. I said, look, man, I, um, I should be dead. I was doing drugs. I was, uh, I was doing just a whole bunch of things that uh, were just incruing God's judgment. I should, I should be in hell right now awaiting the day of judgment. And I would have nothing to say for myself. I deserve hell. And God in his mercy not only delivered me from my drug addiction, but then saw fit to bless me, saw fit to bring me to Christ and give me a wife and give me kids and give me the opportunity to preach his gospel. And now, now like today, I'm moving in a, a new home and, and there's a rainbow in the sky. Like this is, like maybe to you it's a rainbow. But to me, it's a reminder of his mercy and his grace. The Holy Spirit makes things come alive, namely things that deal with God's word. Because he reminds you how precious God's word is to you. Because it's by his word that you've been saved. Lastly, he loved them by giving his life. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I'm going to run back to John 13, and I'm going to just close this uh, by paralleling those four thoughts to you and I as Jesus gives us the command to love one another. Starting at verse 5. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you'll know after. I want to remind you that Peter knew that he was a sinful man. There's a story in the Bible where uh, uh, P- Jesus does a miracle. He, he fills the nets uh, with fish, and they had just got done fishing all night. And when Peter sees the miracle, he cries out to God, to, to Christ. He says, away from me, Lord, away from me. I'm, I'm a sinful man. Basically, he says, uh, I, I, I understand that you're God. I understand that you're the Holy One, that you're the Messiah. And, and I have no right to be in your presence. I, I have no privilege to have this kind of grace towards me. I'm a sinner. I have rebelled against the kingdom. Why? Why would you even stand before me? So you can just kind of picture that mindset as, as the Messiah, the king of the universe, clothed in flesh, now kneels down and begins to wash Peter's feet. And Peter's like, well, come on, Lord. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Come on, Jesus. Don't do this. Don't, don't wash my feet. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered him. If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I can only imagine the the disciples kind of laughing like (laughs) Peter. Peter's crazy, right? So he so so the Lord kind of like threatens him, right? Like or just tells him straight up like, dude, if, if I don't if you don't let me wash you, you have no part in me. And so Peter's like, uh, okay, uh, here, don't just wash my feet then, wash my hands and my head, like, wash all of me. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So Jesus says, listen, if, 
if I've washed you, and of course this is uh, paralleling to the literal washing, if, if you lived in those times, uh, you bathed your body and you wore sandals, and so your whole body was still clean, you had just taken a shower, but as you would walk from uh, house to house, from city to city, your feet would get dirty, and so it wasn't that you needed to wash your body, you just simply needed to wash your feet, and Jesus was paralleling that to their salvation. He's saying, listen, you're already clean, I've cleansed you, I've cleansed you. And how does Christ clean us? Well, as we've discussed, he cleanses us by his word. In fact, Jesus said exactly that in John 15. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. If you receive the words of Christ and you believe, you're given a new heart. The word of God abides in you, makes you alive to God. But can I just say this, that you can be under God's word and not be cleansed? Amongst the twelve, there was one who heard the word but was never cleansed by it. His name was Judas because he had determined in his heart that he loved the things of this world more than he loved the Savior of this world. And even though you might be born again, you still have need of cleansing. As you walk through the, from door to door, from city to city, as you go to your job and back, your feet get dirty. What does that mean? That means uh, you're, you're still born again. You're still saved. You're still filled with the Holy Spirit. You still belong to God. Nothing's changed, but you know what changes is that our flesh gets a little filthy, right? Uh, we hear something at, at work. A, a song gets stuck in our head, something that just ain't right, right? You, you happen to be watching something on TV. You stay a little too long, and, and now that image is stuck in your head. You, you need cleansing. You know, we have this constant debate in, in my high school uh, classroom. Does a Christian need to read the Word of God? Is that essential for salvation? And, and my argument is absolutely yes, because you need to be cleansed every single day. You need to abide in God's Word. And my argument would be, if, you, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that is your greatest desire. Your greatest desire is to be washed daily with God's word. There's nothing like having a long day and hopping in a hot shower. I got any hot shower bath takers up in here? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're a bath taker. Uh, I think in a few years they'll probably get rid of baths. It's like we don't even have time for that anymore, right? We just take a hot shower. Unless you got kids, of course. Um, there's nothing like waking up in the morning and letting God's word just wash over you. Letting God just remind you, you, you belong to me. Whatever happens today, I got you. Whatever you encounter, whatever temptations come, our relationship is greater. Don't ever forget that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's a lot harder to hunger after the things of the world when you just had Jesus in the morning. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I just want to close on, on this thought. Let me, let me read this and just throw out, just parallel this to our lives. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So now Jesus says, as I've washed you, you go and wash others. I gave four ways that Christ washed is us. I just want to parallel that and leave you and I with the commandment that Christ left us with. Number one, he prayed for them. So you also pray for those around you. This is the body of Christ. This is it. Like it or hate it. This is it, right? You get saved. You give your life to Jesus. You, you come to church. You're like, this is it. 
He's filled with the Holy Spirit. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. God, that's the best you could do, right? Well, first of all, God ain't done yet, right? You see some people and you're like, man, there's no way that guy was filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't know what he was like before he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on. You, um, for real, you might say that about me. You're like, Pastor Brandon is not, you know, maybe, I don't know, whatever you've seen, right? You don't know who I was before. I got to remind myself, right? I'm like, man, I'm, Lord, this is it. I start to question my own salvation. Am I really saved? And then I got to remind myself, Brandon, do you remember who you used to be? Wow. And then I got to give him glory. God, you, you've changed me. We pray for one another. Somebody's offended you here at church. That's your brother. You wash them the way Christ has washed you. You pray for them. Ask God. You see a weakness? That's a, that's a beautiful opportunity to pray. You don't, have to, you don't have to remind them in their prayer circles, right? Oh, they did such and such. You just pray for them. You see a, a, an open part in their armor? That's a perfect area for you to pray. God, they're weak in that area. Would you strengthen them? Would you help them? Would you wash them with your word? Number two, he sanctified them by the truth. The Bible says, encourage one another as long as it's called today. Remind your brothers and sisters of the hope and the promises of God's word. The scripture gives us the commandment as husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. I'm commanded as a husband to remind my wife of God's promises when she's discouraged and upset. It's a reminder that God has begun a work and he's going to finish it. So we ought to do for one another as Christ has done for us. Christ gave us the Holy Spirit. So you wash one another by preaching the gospel. That when they hear, they would believe. And that when they believe, they would be filled. And lastly, he gave his very life. So you also give your life for one another. I'll end with this thought. I was watching the Nature Channel the other day on Netflix, which we've been doing a lot lately as a family, Planet Earth. Great. Aside from the fact that they always swear, like, you know, it evolved. You're like, shut up. <laughs> you're watching God's glory, and you're like, he did it. And then they're like, it evolved. You're like... There were lions, and I noticed that every time the lions would come after the pack, and you already know where I'm going with this, they would always, uh, they would just chase them down until one of them got wearied out and got away from the pack, and that's the one that they go for. And the Bible has said that we're the body of Christ, that we're one body, like it or leave it. This is who Christ purchased, and that we're to stay together as a pack. How... How sweet is it in the eyes of the Lord when the brother dwell together in unity? I saw another episode uh, where the lion was coming after these oxen and, and all the oxen began uh, to turn around one to another. One was facing this way, one was facing this way, one was facing this way, and the other facing this way. And they all had their backside together and in the middle uh, was the calves. Is that what you call baby oxen? I have no idea. <laughs> and, um, and the lions just stood there and they looked and they waited. And, they, and, and the oxen just stood there and looked at the lions. And they literally just turned around and walked away. And I just thought, how beautiful is it when God's people are praying for one another, encouraging one another, and the, and the enemy is coming to seek, kill, and destroy. And we're locking arms, going, if, if they fall, I fall with them. But nobody is going down, not under my watch. And when this happens, God is glorified. Because he's in the midst of it all. Let's pray. Father, you have given us this command that we would love one another. God, I trust that as your word is going forth, your Holy Spirit is sanctifying your people by the word, reminding them of people they need to pray for, maybe reminding them of areas that they've let their guard down, 
of people that they've offended and need to apologize. Reminding us to love one another as you have loved us. You're the master, we're the servant. And if you being greater than us all have humbled yourself in such a way as to wash our feet and we like Peter, God, we know that we're not worthy of you washing our feet. But you said unless you wash us, we have no part in you. So we humbly oblige. And now you've commanded us, you go and do likewise. Father, I pray that as you've convicted us, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would obey you. That we'd make amends, we'd turn and strengthen one another, and we'd obey your command. And God, now I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would enable us to fulfill those resolutions. In Jesus' name. Listen, if you're in this room tonight, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, but I am going to ask you that if there is someone in your life that you have offended or somebody in your life that has offended you and the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart to make things right, and with that said, um, there's just a strong conviction of, of a very clear thing that the Holy Spirit is asking you to do. Well, even if it doesn't have anything to do with offense, just the area that you know that the Holy Spirit is asking you to, to love and to wash and to do right. And as a response to say, God, I, I hear you. You've spoken to me clearly. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And the reason is because I just want to pray for you that the Holy Spirit will now empower you to do that for which he's put in your mind and your heart. So if that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Your hand as well. God sees your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand as well. I see your hand to my right. Praise God. No matter how hard it is, the Holy Spirit is going to be with you and help you say the right words, do the right thing. Father, you see those that have lifted up your hand. God, I ask that you would bless them. I ask that you would strengthen them. I ask that first and foremost, God, that they would see by grace and by your mercy what you've done for them, that they're undeserving, unworthy, and yet, uh, Father, your word says that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. I pray, God, that as you've died for us, as you've prayed for us, as you've set us apart by your word, that we would now be strengthened to go and do likewise. So, Father, enable us, enable them to do what you've put in their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to end this night by taking communion. So if you would, stand with uh, me and us. As my brother leads us in worship uh, from the back, if you could just begin to make your way down here and grab the communion, and then those in front of you can come up after them. And we'll take communion together. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me. Because you died.
as we take communion, you know, I was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, your heart being changed. And if you're in this room tonight and uh, you haven't had that experience, maybe you know of God, you know of the Bible, but you haven't had that life transformation and the evidence of God's word working in your heart. And if that's you tonight, before we take communion, I just want to uh, pray with you. And so I'm going to ask all of us, even if uh, you've already uh, been filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would just pray together. Uh, so we're going to pray what we sometimes call the sinner's prayer, which is really just a prayer of asking God for his Holy Spirit. So if you would, just repeat after me. Say, God, I give my life to you. I know that I need to be forgiven. I need a new heart. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Teach me your ways. Make your truth come alive to me that I might serve you with all my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. The, night before, the night that Jesus uh, was betrayed before, they, um, before the event, he uh, did the Passover. And um, as we were just reading about, and so he took the, the cup and, um, and the bread, he broke it. And he said that this bread is in resemblance to his body, which is broken uh, for the world, meaning that he would be crucified on the cross, his flesh would be torn. And so he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. And then he took the, the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is being poured out for the sins of the world. Take and drink. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for uh, not just your death and your resurrection, but all that that entails, the daily washing, God, of your word and uh, the reminder, God, that you're going to finish what you've started. Father, we pray for our loved ones that are lost. We ask that you would redeem them and share with them the truth. God, do for them what you've done for us. Have mercy on their, on their hearts, on their souls, God. And um, God, help us to be faithful to preach the gospel. And God, send others in their lives to minister to them the truth. Father, we thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.